You know, growing up in a conservative pastor's home in the 1960s, I struggled a little bit with my need, my need to be saved. I, I tended to think, well, I'm not that lost. Uh, our family is at church every time the doors are open. I'm actually a pretty good person, generally. But salvation is a, a radical act of God that actually begins by revealing our true spiritual condition. We're lost and helpless. We are incapable of saving ourselves. Romans 3 kind of paints the universal picture, and, and uh, Pastor Wade spent some time there when we were in our Romans series. Uh, verses 10 to 12 say this, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. There is none who does good. There was not even one. Uh, and that includes everybody in the room. <laughs> none of us are exceptions to what Paul said in Romans 3. S but sometimes people seem to kind of shy away from confronting their sin or thinking about their sin, wanting to focus on the grace of God. And God's grace is amazing, right? However, without acknowledging our sin, we can tend to miss how desperate we are for God's grace. Salvation isn't God just giving a nod or giving a nudge to a good person. Not a little facelift, a little nip and tuck here and there and, and the good person is good to go. No, it's a radical act of rescue for those who are helplessly lost. Paul makes it very obvious in today's text. So we're back in Titus 3 and we're gonna begin with verse three. For we, for we also once were foolish ourselves disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul is addressing Titus and the church of Crete in these verses. And whether or not you have experienced God's salvation today. These words are powerful and they are very good news. Let's receive them together and take some time thinking about this big idea. Salvation is a radical transformation which can only be accomplished by God. The first thing that we need to do is to recognize how lost we were. To understand God's grace, we must first recognize the depths from which he saves us. Be before God intervened, we were spiritually bankrupt, in need of profound rescue. As Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, we have to be brought up from a horrible pit. Unless we know something of the depth of that pit, we will only measure half of God's love. In verse three here, Paul reminds us of our previous state, contrasting our former lives with the virtues that he calls believers to embody. He lists seven words or phrases here that emphasize our lostness, characteristics in sharp contrast to who God is and what God is doing. We were foolish a term referring to spiritual dullness, to poor judgment, being senseless toward God. 
It's a mindset alienated from God, driven by sinful desires rather than divine wisdom. The psalmist said in Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And such were we. We were foolish. We were disobedient. And disobedience here isn't merely breaking the rules. It's actually having a rebellious heart against God. Rebellion marked our former lives, both against God, against parents, against authority. I mentioned that on Wednesday nights, we've been going through uh, the, the life of Moses. And obviously, so much of that includes the work of God to make a people for himself and deliver them out of Egypt. But we've been seeing that time after time after time, the people were re rebellious against God. And time after time after time, he forgave them. But it seems as though their only inclination, even having the Ten Commandments right in front of them, their only inclination was disobedience and rebellion. Actually, I'm reminded of verse 16 of chapter 1, where Paul was talking about the false teachers on Crete, the island of Crete. And, and he said, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. That was our inclination as well. Bent toward rebellion against God. We were also deceived, misled. This deception encompasses being both deceived by others and being self-deceived. That is, living aimlessly without the wisdom of God in our lives. If I'm deceiving you, I know it. But if I'm being deceived, I don't even realize that I'm being deceived. This is what makes deception so dangerous. It's the result of pride and ignorance coming together. It was one of Satan's first tactics and he's still using it today. Hundreds of millions of people are still deceived about who God is and about the true story of Jesus. One of the things, one of the things that Laura and I pray for every day for uh, family members, for friends, for their kids and so on, is for their eyes to be opened and for them to be set free from deception. As well, we were slaves to various lusts and pleasures. Part of the deception that people believe today is that they are more free than ever, when in reality they are more bound up than ever. Lusts extend beyond sexuality. They include a relentless drive to please myself. They are all those things that, that we feel with our senses. We were powerless against this bondage. Paul said in Romans 6, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? We were bound up. We were slaves. We were also characterized by malice and envy. Uh, this is a spirit of ill will and jealousy. Malice is not necessarily a word that we use so much anymore, but it's this inner negative disposition toward other people. That sounds like Dennis the Menace's neighbor. What was that guy's name? <laughs> An inner negative disposition toward others. And envy is what fuels our discontentment. It goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. 
Now, we might think that malice and envy have no place today in polite society, and, and perhaps it's true that in civilized society we work hard to cover some of these things to appear nice. But the moment that any external restraints are removed, malice and envy rise up to kill and destroy. And we're seeing more and more of it in Western society now. We were hateful and hating each other, displaying the conflict and discord within fallen humanity. The thing is, it's, it's our broken relationship with God that leads to broken relationships with others. This seems to be way more evident during a political season, don't you think? Maybe it's this, this season, but maybe it's every political season that we've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> we hear it in the name calling, we see it in the headlines, people are dehumanized and then they're deplatformed and they're alienated. How can we share a country with those people? And the hatred <clears throat> just flows. So the, the bleak picture in verse 3 here, it isn't meant to condemn but to remind us of the depths of God's rescue of us. God's love and grace reconcile us to him and to each other. It's God's power that provides freedom, releasing us from sin's control to walk freely in the spirit. When we remember our own deception and disobedience, it promotes humility in us and compassion for others who are still trapped there. For those saved from an early age, this may feel a little bit distant. If you were saved as a child, and now you're perhaps in your 60s, 70s, and so on, this might feel distant, but Paul's message is that all people share in this lost state without God. Friends, salvation is a radical transformation which can only be accomplished by God. And so we recognize how lost we were. And then Paul reminds us that salvation changes everything. Let me read verses four to seven again. They're so beautiful. A, a, a wonderful, concise description of the gospel of Jesus. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. <laughs> Isn't it amazing what a wonderful word but is, B-U-T. Everything changes in that word. First we see what is the source, the real source of our salvation. No, it's not, it's not our works of righteousness. That's not the source. Our salvation is entirely unrelated to our good works. The thing is, every religion outside of biblical Christianity suggests or believes that our good deeds somehow play a role in our salvation or somehow bringing us close to nirvana or close to paradise, close to God. But Paul says in Galatians 2, 16, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. No person is going to be justified by doing good stuff. We're not saved by our efforts, but by God's mercy alone. We've just talked about how bad we are, how bad we were, how far we were from God. We were actually his enemies. The idea that we could do something, that we could bring something that would cause God to view us as worthy of friendship, worthy of sonship, is preposterous. It would be like, it's, and it's hard to put this into big enough terms, it seems to me, but it would be like having the owner of Norwegian Cruise Lines invite Laura and I on an all-expense-paid cruise, 
And then, but then us bringing a little nine by nine green bean casserole to the big buffet table that stretches out for a mile. We're bringing a little casserole and, and then we offer to clean cabins and to wash dishes for the whole cruise just to pay our way. How ridiculous, how ridiculous is that? And God's grace and God's mercy, it's bigger than that. And our works, our works of right, it's like, it's, it's not even a good green bean casserole. It's, it's a green bean casserole with rotten beans and, and poison mushrooms. That's what it is. Salvation doesn't come from us, but oh, how we keep trying. <laughs> Friends, it doesn't matter how many sacrifices you make for your family or even for the church. It doesn't matter how many shoeboxes we pack. It doesn't matter how much money we give. It doesn't matter how many hours we serve. We could never do enough. We could never do enough good stuff to meet God's standard of love and acceptance. Why? Because we're not the source. We're not the source of it. Salvation flows out of his kindness and his love. God's kindness here refers to his, his benevolent goodness. <laughs> He's the best king ever. In contrast to the, to the Greco-Roman myths where, where men were exalted to God-like status for their good things that they did, Paul says here that God's goodness appeared from above in Jesus. Not from a human achievement, God's goodness came as kindness and love in Christ. This divine love reached us, not because we earned it, but simply because of God's affectionate concern for you and for me. His kindness leads us to repentance. His love forgives. Salvation flows from his love and his kindness. It also flows from his mercy, from what Paul says here. Yes, it's true. God is not fair. He offers to not give us what we deserve. That's not fair. He offers to not give us what we deserve. Mercy is God's relief to sinners. When we accept that we bring nothing but our need, we're standing on solid ground. God alone has done the work. And this should quickly lead us to humble worship. His kindness, his love and mercy are the source of our salvation. But Paul also talks about the means of our salvation too. What is the, what is the means of our salvation? Well, salvation comes about by a, a regeneration, is a word that we sometimes use. It's a, a new birth, a washing that God initiates. Just as we had no role in our physical birth, we're passive in our spiritual birth too. God's command gives us life, just as Jesus called Lazarus from the grave. You know, I wonder if Paul may have thought about Ezekiel's image that we actually read earlier. Those, that, those verses from Ezekiel where he talks about God washing his people, washing their sins away, washing away their idols, making them clean. I wonder if Paul had that image in mind when he talked about this new birth, this, cre this new creation. Christianity is not unique in the idea of washing or sprinkling as an image of initiation into the worship of a God. But only by the power of our God can we be washed clean from the inside out. The hymn writer said it like this, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. You remember that hymn? And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I'm going to ask Donnie and Randy if they would come. And once again today, I, want to, I would like us to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, in, 
within this message because I think it fits so well into what we're talking about with regard to, go ahead and take the bread, brothers, with regard to what we're talking about as far as the, the work of Christ, the work of Christ on our behalf. Let me just say a quick prayer. God, we are so blessed that we can be together and that today, in the middle of all of these thoughts that are swirling around the room and in our minds and our hearts, that we uh, can celebrate, uh, celebrate your death, uh, celebrate the blood that you shed, celebrate the sacrifice that you made for us. And so we do that now with gratitude in Jesus' name, amen. As they pass uh, these <coughs> crackers, I wanna say that um, uh, we observe open communion. You don't have to be a member of our church to partake in communion. I just ask that you know what I'm talking about, that you've experienced what I'm talking about uh, with regard to God's grace in your life and your faith, placing your faith in him. And if you're not at that place, feel free to not participate uh, in this as well. But this, this washing, this washing is one thing that God does, washing us clean. And then there's also what uh, Paul talks about as a renewal of the Holy Spirit. There's a renewing that goes on here as well. And I believe that in this context, this is the, the new life that the Spirit brings into us in the moment of new birth. And so he washes us, and then, he, and then we're filled with the life of God at that moment that we place our trust in him. Because he says the Holy Spirit is being poured out on us abundantly. We are both being washed to the condition of newness and being filled with the new life of God. As Derek read, go ahead and set it down here. You have, have you taken a cracker there? All right. As Derek read last week uh, from uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we're a new creation now. The old has gone, the new has come. And a part of that was the washing, us being washed clean by God's spirit, and then us being filled with the life of God by God's spirit as well. As we come to this, this symbol of Christ's broken body, I wanna be sure that we're coming and there's nothing between us and God as we partake of this, so that, we, that we're coming in a worthy manner like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So I'd like us just to take a moment of silence and, and uh, ask God to seek our hearts, that we would just confess anything that he brings to mind that perhaps is standing between us. We want our fellowship to be intimate. Amen. Let us eat with thanksgiving. Okay, brothers, if you would pass out the, uh, the juice as well. There's this washing of new birth. There is a filling with God's life. And then because of that, we are justified by his grace. God declares sinners righteous by crediting them with the righteousness of Jesus at the moment that they believe from Romans 3, Romans chapter 3 and 4. Justification is an act of God's grace to us, giving us something that we can never earn or deserve. 
You know, there's a sense in which this, it, it, it's only, it feels like it throws justice out the window, but it doesn't. It definitely throws fairness and karma out the window. It kind of throws them to the wind because God's justice, God's perfect justice has been satisfied in the sacrifice of Jesus. God kept his standard of perfection, his standard of justice, his standard of holiness. He didn't come down to our level and bring his standard down to whatever we could figure out or whatever we could manage. No, he made it possible for us to be raised up to that standard because of Jesus, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us by, by his blood shed on the cross for us. Go ahead and take a cup there. And so, and so in a sense, this is a somber moment, but in, in a way, it's also a very joyful moment as well. It is a celebration because we're remembering, we're remembering his death on our behalf until he comes again. And so let's drink with thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can put the cups in a little holder there in front of you. So salvation, salvation is based on the kindness and the mercy and the love of God. It comes to us by washing and, and by this filling, by justification. Paul gives us the source of our salvation. He gives us the means of our salvation. And then in that last verse, he gives us the result of our salvation, which is our hope of eternal life. We are now inheritors. We are his children. We have an inheritance with Christ. As believers, our salvation brings us into this new inheritance, this hope of eternal life. This inheritance is assured. It's as secure as God's promise for us right now and yet not fully realized until the life to come. Hope here does not imply uncertainty. Well, I hope that that happens, but rather it speaks of our future reality. Through Christ, we are God's children. We are written into God's will. What is his is ours. Through Jesus, we share in God's age-old promises secured for us by a divine adoption. This powerful truth was meant to encourage Titus and the Cretan believers to live with confidence uh, and looking forward to their eternal inheritance despite the lies and the discouragements that they might face in the surrounding culture. The hope of eternal life gives those of us who have placed our trust in Jesus, it gives us a reason to endure. It gives us a reason to trust and to keep on trusting, knowing that our future is secure and it's held in God's hands. The challenge for us this morning is not to go out and do something so that God will love and accept us as his children. No. If this disobedience and deception, these other negative characteristics that I've talked about, if that describes your life still today, the call to you is to believe that God has already provided a way for you in Christ. He has already made a way to become his child. Believe that what he has said is true. What he has done is true. It's all real. Receive the free gift. Turn away from the road that you were on and turn toward him and thank him for such an amazing free gift for you, for me. And then simply live free 
and loved. And what if you have already received this free gift, but you still have times of rebellion? You still have some times where you're dealing with various lusts and pleasures that are still, they seem to be kind of hanging on. Well, God has provided the victory for that as well. We have the power to overcome these things as we pursue him and as we allow him to keep filling us and controlling us on a daily basis. Be willing to lay it down, to give it up. Declare yourself dead to whatever is holding you back and keeping you defeated. This is the power, not just to transform us, but to transform our whole culture like I talked about a couple of weeks ago. We receive him by faith and we walk every day by faith. Salvation is a radical transformation which can only be accomplished by God. Are you convinced? Do you believe it? In salvation, we see a stunning contrast between our sin and God's grace. While we were active in rebellion, God was active in love. His mercy and kindness and love reached down and saved us when we were powerless. We bring nothing to our salvation but our need. God loved and saved us because he's gracious, not because we deserved it. Therefore, our response now, our response now to this great salvation is gratitude, worship, and a transformed life that reflects his grace in increasing measure to the world around us.